or is my screen visible yes okay i'll start so yeah so today i'll be presenting on fusion microfinance they basically provide financial services to women entrepreneurs belonging to the underserved communities etc and their aim is to provide underprivileged women with economic opportunities to transform the quality of their lives so let's begin by knowing our company so uh, fusion microfinance was basically founded with the core idea of creating opportunities at the bottom of the pyramid and it is a nbfc mfi that provides financial services to low income households and micro enterprises in india it was uh, incorporated in uh, back in 1994 as an nbfc under the, under the name uh, ambience fincap private limited and in 2009 the company changed their name to fusion microfinance and it was then con converted to a nbfc mfi a microfinance institution so their mission is to empower the under uh, underserved and financially excluded segments of the society by providing them with access to credit savings insurance and other financial services so they have since uh, they were founded they have grown to become one of the leading microfinance institutes in india and they have a presence in over 20 states across our country and they have a very customer centric approach and they focus on innovation and responsible lending with this they have been able to uh, build a strong reputation in their specific industry 100% of their clients uh, comprise women living in rural and then peri rural as in the outskirts uh, outskirt areas etc and their core like uh, business model is to provide uh, financial support to this particular segment and you know kind of like decrease financial literacy and increase awareness to the customers etc and adjacent to this they also do a lot of csr they have a csr policy which basically focuses on key like perspectives such as uh, health hygiene sanitation and then primary education etc so yeah they have a stable and experienced core management team and they also have a strong second line with uh, diversified experience in progressive orientation and they focus on home grown talent and currently their team size is of over 10000 people across 1057 locations yeah so they also operate on a, a joint liability group with gramin and they were publicly listed in november 2022 so here's basically a timeline of the investments that has received uh, that they have received over the years so even when we see the promoter holding we'll see uh, there are three pe firms that hold majority of the share shares so moving on to the promoter holding so it is a promoter driven company 68% is held by the promoters however the promoters include three pe firms and then the sachdev family uh, hold around 5% and they uh, mr sachdev has also placed 2.36% of his holdings uh, in the uh, december quarter of fy2023 and yeah besides they don't have any subsidiary as such and they do not have any jvs with any organization so if we see the promoter holding there are three pe firms that is honey rose investment limited so they have 39.37% stake in the company this is a mauritius based like uh, entity and it is one of the largest shareholders as we see it is uh, owned by warburg pincus which is one of the biggest pe fir uh, firms and then the other two other two are basically your creation investments they come under creation investments which is a pe firm again uh, and yeah they have invested in fusion through two entities that is creation investments fusion 1 and then this fusion 2 so they have respectively 13.83% and 9.89% next uh yeah quickly let's just go through the fii holdings there's nippon aditya billa and icici kota uh which holds uh, shares in the company and there's dia there's massachusetts uh, institute of technology and there's a trust called the nomura trust so talking about Should their you, business, yeah uh, could you hide the bubble oh you, okay this thing uh, sorry yeah, yeah 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 no problem yeah is it gone yes it's gone okay yes yeah. so talking about their business so 
primarily they are they were purely uh, purely a microfinance institution so they did not have other business segments as such but recently in 2019 they have uh, began with msme but it is only a small percentage of their entire portfolio so so they primis, primarily it consists of micro loans for income generating activities and their portfolio includes like various types of loans such as agriculture loans livestock loans small business loans and home improvement loans so these income generating loans basically are they are like core product and they are used by women in rural areas and are intended to intended intended to like provide capital for all their small businesses msme which they started in 2019 uh, so these loans are offered to eligible enterprises uh, that have like an investment limit of less than 15 lakhs so up to 15 lakh uh, lakhs fusion grants uh, them alone and in this particular segment since they started in 2019 they have managed to create 34 branches and they have enrolled 5000 plus customers and as of uh, uh, fy 2022 this portfolio is of around rupees 140 crores and then emergency loans is something that uh, they give to existing customers who need like a uh, who have urgent financial requir- requirements that uh, arise out of like unforeseen events such as health emergencies natural disasters etc so to be eligible for this they have to be like uh, a customer already and have at least completed one cycle of company's income generation loans and uh, with no outstanding loan amount obviously and they grant this loan amount ranging from 3000 rupees to 7000 rupees and yeah they are paid within generally a period of 8 months a top up loan uh, is uh, like an extra loan that is offered over and above an existing loan amount that a customer has such as like home loan and a personal loan top up loan is offered to customers who already are <clears throat> i have an existing relationship with fusion and they should have a good credit score and repayment ability so cross selling is again is basically selling additional products to their existing customer base and yeah so 100 like i said 100% of their clientele is women living in rural and peri rural areas so the loans are typically very small in size uh, as compared to these other nbfcs and with short uh, like they have short repayment periods and low interest rates also they also like provide training and support services to the clients to help them manage their businesses more effectively and sorry one second yeah and uh, yeah their om as of uh, quarter 3 fy 2023 is around uh, i think 8653 crores and a year on growth of like 45% and this is basically a split of their uh, segments um as a percentage of the om and we can see msme they have recently started in 2019 it's only around 2.2% but majority of their loans are from agricultural agriculture and allied activities so yeah with msme they also mentioned that they want to bring more expertise into this vertical and they want to access like larger ticket loans or higher loans and handhold customers but as such they have not uh, specifically ma- mentioned any plans but they do plan on expanding this vertical and <clears throat> yeah they are uh, we, we do have to like note that their clients typically have like limited sources of income savings and even credit histories it's completely different from the clientele of other nbfcs and their loans they are like fusions loans are typically provided free of collateral so since these clients do not have like high level of financial support resilience and as a result they can be fusion can be negatively affected during events such as covid demonetization etc the repayment can be affected so fusion relies on the non traditional guarantee mechanisms rather than or uh, you know taking tangible assets as a collateral so this sometimes cannot be very effective in recovering the value of their loans so talking about their geographical presence they have a wide geographical presence across india they have more than one oh, sorry they have uh, 1057 branches across uh, 20 states and this like their extensive network like that they have built around um, uh, india it allows them to reach the most remote areas of the country where traditional banks also do not have a presence 
so this has mainly helped them to build strong relationships with their clients and gain their trust so we can see here they have 212 branches in uttar pradesh and 145 branches in bihar so these two states are among the largest and most populated states in india and they have a significant amount of rural population so the strong presence of fusion in these states basically reflects their commitment to providing financial inclusion to low income households and micro enterprises in rural areas and in addition to up and bihar they are also present in other states like madhya pradesh rajasthan maharashtra gujarat karnataka tamil nadu west bengal etc so and they are currently their borrowers per, per branch standard 3381 Uh, as of quarter 3 fy23 whereas last year uh, it was 2983 so if we can see that the presence in the north region is higher comparatively than the south and central regions yeah quickly talking about the awards and recognitions they got the microfinance organization of the year in 2022 they got a great place to offer three consecutive years and then financial inclusion and literacy award and then there's best nbfc mfi by sosham also the scotch order of merit award in 2018 one more thing was that even during the period of covid they did not have any pay cuts or and and had zero layoffs so next we move on to the promoter and board firstly mr devesh sachdev he is the md and ceo ceo he was uh, first appointed to the board in 2009 and he is in excel ri xavier school of management post graduate and has also attended and successfully completed the strategic leadership program with harvard business school and prior to starting fusion in 2009 2010 he had 14 years of experience in the service industry he has over 26 years of experience in the financial services industry with a focus on microfinance and rural banking he has been associated with fusion since its inception in 1994 and has played a key role in their uh, uh, growth so uh, in addition to his role at fusion he is also associated with several other industrial bodies such as sadhan and then mfin which is microfinance institutions network and he is actively involved in uh, promoting the microfinance sector so his uh, entrepreneurial journey basically started with a company called bsa which was a small size logistics company back in the day he um, spearheaded their growth um, from single city operations limited service offerings to a pan india foothold and then also diversified services making the company bsa a market leader in their segment so he was also re responsible for like developing and re uh, retaining relationship with multinational banks leading private banks telecom companies and other corporates there so he took bsa to new heights he made it operational in 26 cities which had 500 employees 300 business associates handling transactions of around 4 million rupees per million per month uh I, okay we might be dollars i'm sorry so they he was the first professional manager to be appointed director on the board of all the group companies of bsa and he is also held positions with the uh, city corp and then samarth financial consulting consultancy etc next we move on to mr narendra ostawal he um he is a nominee director from uh, hani rose investments so, which is owned by Hoberg and he has also i mean he also serves as a board member at India First then Capital First Avans uh, financial services and uh, also Loras Labs so he's been associated with uh, Warburg Pincus since uh, 2007 uh, he currently holds the position of MD there he has 20 years of experience and has previously been associated uh, with 3i India uh, and then McKinsey and company so he holds a post graduate diploma in management from iim bangalore he is also a member of the icai prior, prior to joining warburg he worked with mckinsey next we move on to mr kenneth wheel <clears throat> he is a co-founding member of creation investments and he was instrumental in basically building that uh, creation investments so he, he sits on the firm's investment committee and on the board of many portfolio companies he is a cpa 
and he has done his phd from oxford <laughs> he has over 15 years of experience and has served on the board of several companies including credit access grameen muthoot microfinance sonata finance so and he also serves served as a president for opportunity international which is a leading ngo in financial inclusion assisting in their growth from dollar 5 million to dollar 1 billion in assets then we have mrs ratna she um, mrs ratna vishwanathan she has over 35 years of experience and has worked in the past with government of india united nations office for project services m then m fin oxfam india united nations development program she holds a bachelor of arts degree from utkal university bhubaneswar bhubaneswar and studied masters of uh, master of arts at the university of lucknow she has an extensive uh, experience across a wide range of diversified sectors such as strategy building microfinance project management change management hr and financial management then we have ms namrata call she is a career banker with extensive experience of over 33 years uh, across treasury corporate banking debt capital markets and corporate finance in india and uk uh, she was managing director at deutsche bank and she led the corporate bank practice as its india head she was also responsible for managing risk credit compliances and regulatory reporting for the corporate pol- portfolio of the bank in uh, deutsche bank uk as part as part of the strategic leadership team aiming to strengthen cross border network she set up an asia desk in london so she was a member of the deutsche bank asia executive committee basically currently she is the independent director on like several other companies boards as well like vipriti capital schneider electric then bhopal smart city development corporation etc etc then we have mr pankaj vesh who is also an independent director he holds a bachelor of technology degree in mechanical engineering from iit uh, bhu banaras hindu university and he has pursued a master of business administration mba from the university of minnesota usa so he was awarded the bhu medal for standing first in his bachelor of technology fifth year examinations in mechanical engineering and he has also won the distinguished alumni award of excellence by the association of iit bhu he has over 35 years of experience um, work experience he was associated with accenture um, for over 28 years in various roles including as the manager uh, managing director for accenture's delivery center network for bpo and as the asia pacific operating unit lead for communications media and technology in business so he was also associated with seva trade facilitation center as a senior advisor and currently is working as the professor of practice of management at the amrut modi school of management in ahmedabad he is also an advisor to insource operational optimizers private limited and unilax consumer solutions consumer solutions sorry and in the past he has served on the boards of lakshmi vilas bank then aptus and is also currently on the board of iifl wealth management and then krishna institute of medical sciences um next we um, have certain awards and recognitions that they have got uh, i have already mentioned mr pankaj jaisa's uh, achievements then mr devesh sachdev has also got certificate appreciation for 50 fastest growing ceos of india by the ceo magazine and then also outstanding contribution to financial inclusion award at the india microfinance awards in 2017 so So I went through a few interviews of Mr. Sachdev. He seems very confident in his interviews. He speaks with a lot of enthusiasm and also seems very optimistic about the future future of uh, fusion microfinance. So in the first interview, he talks about the uh, their approach basically, which has resulted in good numbers and consistent growth. He says that as a company, they stand for their transparency and their consistency. He claims that they believe in walking the talk. he also talks about their asset quality and collection efficiency being about 98% and then also talks about their presence in bihar and up which are growth states of india and there's a lot of high demand there and he says that their branches are well established there second interview he talks about a uh, <clears throat> uh, strategic comparative advantage that uh, this basically their diversification in the northern states so with again up and bihar so he talks about their geography in the second interview and then the, he's also asked a question about uh, the election manifesto like which 
such as farm, farm loan waivers, etc. How they affect the company's NPAs and uh, and what impact it has on the company, basically. So, so he says that, <clears throat> yeah. So he says that the risk has drastically gone down over the years and then gives pretty much an explanation about it, talking about the credit bureau and the government's perspective, et cetera. And in the third interview, he talks about the ROE, which has averaged around 15% for the last three years, uh, financial years, and how they grow from grew from a 3,600 crore portfolio in March 2020 to a 7,400 crore portfolio in 2022. Yeah, and then he also talks about RBI deregulating pricing, etc. Yeah, so if we talk about his holdings, uh, like I said, him and his wife they hold around five percent. This is the split. Next, we move on to risk mitigation and underwriting. So, firstly, we'll talk about the ILFS crisis. So the company performed well actually during this crisis, but mainly because um, uh, they were no way like directly connected to ILFS, and they they are lending. <clears throat> I mean, they lend to a completely different segment. That to to 100% their clientele is women from rural areas. So that is pretty obvious. But then other than that, what helped them kind of still. <clears throat> uh, strive through this crisis was one was they had a positive ALM so the micro like finance industry their growth has been relatively higher despite the impact of various events like demonetization and like I said farm loan waivers or even natural calamities and like a ILFS crisis and then COVID-19 so they had like a proper ALM framework, they conducted a thorough assessment of their exposure to LFS. And they and then also they maintained sufficient liquidity. And they also monitored, continuously monitored the monitor the credit quality of their borrowers. And they also reduced risk, uh, exposure to riskier segments. And another thing they focused on was their capital adequacy. They made sure that they maintained a high level of capital adequacy. Other than that, they had a like they have a proven track record of highly governed and well managed like organization. Yeah, most reports that are like suppose ICICI or any one that has reported, they talk about their governance as a key strength. And then also their management again, they strengthen their risk management policies, etc. One more thing that uh, was a great validation for them during this period was the investment they got from Warburg Pincus, like Honey Rose Investments. Uh, so they basically got liquidity support and this all enabled them to continue lending to their borrowers, even as other sources of like funding were disrupted. Like we saw in the case of mass financials, how the cost of borrowing increased for them. However, it's not the same in this case. Yeah, and then, <clears throat> Yeah, and then uh, yeah, also this uh, investment helped them with expanding their business. They opened new branches also during the same period, and also it gave them a certain kind of a credibility because Warburg Pink is a reputed firm, and them investing during this period uh, infusion was very, uh, you know, uh, sorry, yeah, it was great for them, and then even their rating was upgraded from uh, BBB plus to A during the same period. And yeah, one more thing is uh, their key strength, which is diversified and high quality lenders. So this also helped them. So yeah. Sorry. So if we see their OM during the quarters, so obviously it was a little bit difficult to retrieve the data for all the six quarters because Fusion got listed recently. So back then they did not really give their quarterly results as such. So we can see by this that during that period, their arm continued to grow. It wasn't really affected. Same in the case of uh, GNP and NPA, which, which is quite uh, surprising. It, it decreased instead, if we see from FY19 to FY20. And then uh, ROE, ROE numbers. <clears throat> ROE, um, here it fell because of COVID uh, instead, like not the ILFS crisis. But if we see the cost of borrowing, 
uh, is the opposite in this case compared to an, uh, the other NBFCs, which we see during that period, their cost of borrowing has increased. But in the case of uh, fusion, the cost of borrowing has decreased during the same period. <clears throat> so, yeah, and with respect to their business model, management, etc., there were no changes they made. And uh, next, we move on to their risk mitigation framework. So they follow this uh, thing called the three lines of defense approach, which is like a risk management framework that helps organizations to manage risks effectively. So in this approach, firstly, uh, the first line of defense is made up of the various like business and support functions that are responsible for identifying, assessing, and managing risks in their respective areas. And the second line of defense is made up of the risk management and compliance function, which provides oversight and guidance to the first line of defense. And the second line also like um, ensures that the risk management policies and procedures are in place and being followed by the organization. And finally, the third line uh, is made up of the audit function, which provides independent assurance on the effectiveness of the risk management practices across the organization. So they basically have summed up their entire defense framework into these three lines and they have a, a very strong approach if you go through their ppt they have specifically mentioned what uh what things they do differently when it comes to risk mitigation so uh one more thing i'd like to mention is the key strategies that uh, uh that are adopted by fusion to basically ensure healthy asset quality so they have a separate audit and risk management team with clear KRAs and functionalities, uh, KRA, KRAs as in key result areas and functionalities to ensure like complete adherence to laid down business policies and our early detection of uh, scams, frauds, and any malpractice as such. So they have this very rigor regressive and thorough risk mechanism, like review mechanism. So audit digitization is also another thing they do. They use data analytics for more like incisive audit and it enables them to identify and like zero in on areas of concern at an early stage. Also, one more thing they do is geotagging uh, of their branches and group meeting locations, which allows the audit team to undertake like surprise uh, audit visits with ease. And the same like helps them ensure that the field st staff is like always, you know, on their toes and <clears throat> lastly they they have created like a specialized fraud control unit itself with like three like their key responsibility is basically identifying like an early detecting fraud and any gaps in a manner that like there's no fraud that occurs in the future so next we have the forensics analysis so they did pretty well they scored 90 percent and they got 20 out of the 22 checks, right? So the three checks which it did not <clears throat> kind of pass are firstly promoter skin in the game, pledge shares. So like I said, uh, Mr. Sachdeva has pledged like two. Mr. Sachdeva has pledged 2.36% of his hold, holdings in the December 2022 quarter. Other than that, has auditor remuneration grown much faster than revenue growth year on year any of the last three years? So yeah, this we had discussed yesterday, basically. Uh, yeah, so their uh, uh, remuneration for their auditor, who is, uh, the company name is SR Bartley Boy and Associates. They are pretty well known, and they are also member firms of the Ernst and uh, Young Global Limited, um, EY. And so what happened was uh, for FY19, 20, uh, even, uh, yeah, 21, the, remuneration raised in between 20 20 to 30 lakhs and yeah in fy 20 uh one it was 27 lakhs and then suddenly in fy 22 it shot up to 72 lakhs uh i am still looking into this i'm i've not been able to find out like a proper explanation of like why this happened uh one thing was um uh, the current like their auditors statutory uh, auditors it is their last like year with them and other than that they also got publicly listed but then it is a big jump so i'm not sure but yeah for further investigation is required here and then lastly was the rpt in which the question was does the director's remuneration for the year as percentage of pat exceed 11 percent so yeah yes it does uh in fy22 their pat was only 22 crores but the <clears throat> 
remuneration of Mr. Sachdev was 3.75 crores, which is like 17% of the pad. Other than uh, this, they passed all the checks, but these two, uh, these three have to be like further looked into. Uh, then we move on to the key metrics. So firstly, we have our OM. <clears throat> so Fusion Microfinance is the second largest and one of the fastest growing NBFC MFIs in India as of now. And their uh, OM CAGR for the past five years has been 55%. So yeah, like they said, they are very particular about their consistent growth and we can see that in their uh, OM growth. So they aspire to maintain like healthy, medium, like growth trajectory basically. And they plan to open more branches. And in, uh, yeah, so they have added 0.68 million more customers and they basically focus on increasing their customer base. Yeah, and this, uh, also, one more thing is that none, like not a single state contributes to greater than 20% of their own, which helps them like diversify. Also, the CAGRs are mentioned here, and that is the year on year growth. <clears throat> and then next, we talk about the GNPA. Uh, also, book value per share, uh, since it was listed in November 2022, I could not uh, you know, obviously make a graph. And yeah, GNP, NNPA, they are gradually imp improving. You can see it suddenly shot up in between. Uh, I think this is because they lend to uh, underserved communities, like and also the challenges the microfinance sector has faced in the past five, ten years, say. And also the unsecured lo loans they give against, like no collateral and everything. So during like COVID, et cetera, or so, such conditions, uh, I'm sure their repayment was affected. Uh, however, like this, they are uh, current NPAs, uh, NPA numbers are in line with the average of other NBFC MFIs and actually lower than other microfinance linked banks. Like it, uh, oh, the average would be 4.2% if you take uh, like their peers as such. And the <clears throat> like, However, the asset quality, it has improved, but it is still like higher than if you see the pre-COVID levels, 1% and 0.5%. However, it's higher now. Uh, so it is something to like look out for. If their NPAs increase or like the cre credit quality gets worsens, it could like affect them adversely and their, <clears throat> yeah, their cash flow operations will get affected. ROE. ROE, ROE, their numbers are like, uh, if you uh, read the reports or even their con call, they are saying that they're set to improve. And uh, namely, ROE, ROE stood at 0.3% and ROE stood at 1.7% uh, in FY22, specifically because uh, they had lower profits. Like I said, PAT was only 22 CR during the period, whereas the previous year, year it was 70 crores. And yeah, one more thing they mentioned was uh, one of the reasons that uh, their ROE, ROA and ROEs were affected because of their LLPs. And yeah, so basically uh, they are creating more provision, higher provisions now. And this, they say, will help them uh, increase their ROA and ROE further. So their goal basically right now is to uh, maintain these uh, like ROAs in the range of 4.5 to 4.75 percent and ROAs in the range of 18 to 20 percent. So they plan to strengthen the balance sheet as well by giving those you know extra provisions etc. So this LLP thing was the reduction which they'll do now in the LLP. They say is one of the biggest drivers for their ROA. Pure comparison, yeah, so I've compared it with four other companies in terms of their OM, FECCA, Grameen, uh, Credit Access Grameen is much larger and Arman is much smaller as compared to the rest. But then Fusion, Spandana and Satin, they are pretty much in the same bracket. And if you see that uh, GNP and NNPA, it's in sort of a similar space. Uh, the NNPAs are <clears throat> slightly, uh, sorry, the GNP is uh, pretty um, pretty much close to the one other other um, peers, and the NNPAs are also in the same range. If we see, in terms of ROA ROE, they are doing uh, comparatively better with their ROE. Uh, 
and doing average with their ro roa numbers as well so no sir like if we compare it to peers they are pretty much in the same range not much of a difference nothing like to be concerned about here so yeah p by bv ratio uh, fusion is at 2.64x ca is at 3x and then spandana and satin satin like almost 1x and then arman is at 4x so uh basically fusion uh, as such with their plans and their how they plan to like grow their ROEs, ROEs, etc and their profitability we'll have to see how they go from 2x or if uh, 2x to a 3x or a 4x and like what like what is their way forward basically so we'll go on to their future outlook now <clears throat> yeah so om growth they have been consistent with it like we saw in the graph uh, CAGR was 55% and for the past five years and they aspire to maintain healthy medium growth trajectory basically consistent growth however like if the growth like uh, is slower than what they expect it can lead to like uh, lower earnings and then all their ratios will get affected but but right now as of now uh, if you forecast for it then they are they they'll surely give better results in the coming years and the coming quarters so branches uh, in their con call they are mentioned that they they uh, as of 2022 they were targeting to open 170 branches uh, between like ms mfi and then their new vertical msme and out of that 140 have already been opened and around 17 they have got sanctions for it so yeah they are pretty focused on expanding their network and that that is one of the key strengths at play here. and yeah they what they do is like what they follow is that they invest in uh, like branch infrastructure and assets up front upon entering a new state uh that basically gives them like a leverage uh with their existing infrastructure and the knowledge of the local landscape so then they have like already a good position to further like penetrate into those areas uh and the already existing market uh, and again, like I mentioned, no state contributes more than 20% of the total loan. That they're pretty particular about that too. That so that if in case there's some economic uh, issue, then there's uh, they don't get affected too badly. Then business units, yeah. So talking about business units, uh, they don't really have many verticals. So there's only one MSME other than the them purely being a microfinance institution so uh with respect to business their main focus is only adding new customers and then new credit customers to their portfolio that's how they plan to grow then one more thing is that um their digital orientation they are uh, <clears throat> they're pretty uh, updated and in touch with technology they've been using um sorry i forgot the term but they've been using dig digitalization since 2010 itself or uh, you would see in their earlier annual reports that they mentioned uh, how they are <clears throat> how they basically do credit assessment etc so they have adopted something that they call fidgetil which is physical plus digital connection with their clients so they use technology uh, like to basically solve any queries with, with their clients and yeah this this they say is more cost effective like transition uh instead of the traditional way so and uh, yeah and they have improved their digital onboarding from 30 percent in 2018 to 100 percent in 2022 and their cashless disbursement again from 20 percent in 2018 to 97 in 2022 97 percent in 2022 they also adopted early cloud technology and they have a scalable open api architecture they also use advanced technology such as UPI collections, facial recognition, and also real-time credit check. In terms of uh, like security, they have implemented email security, then EDR, which is endpoint detection and response, then device encryption also, then data classification, then data loss prevention, and they also have been awarded the ISS certification for the same. <clears throat> so overall if you see their way forward seems to be focused like on their ex expanding their network while maintaining like a strong focus on their core strengths and also investing heavily in technology and human capital to support future growth 
next with differentiation as such i could not uh, specifically find a certain things which they do completely different but however i've kind of generalized it knowing they are like what they do and uh, the customer base they serve so with respect to their presence they have a relatively better position uh, in rural regions compared to any of its peers and uh, yeah so this like deeper reach that they have into rural areas will surely like uh, help them uh, reach out to the clients in that area and they focus on providing financial services to women in rural areas which sets it apart from any other microfinance institution because that is their main focus and with respect to diversification they are focused on like reducing state concentration risk like i said 20 percent less than 20 percent uh from each state the om percentage and then <clears throat> yeah so they also exp they are also expanding into new states and then they are widening their reach even more into untapped markets like i said there's no they're uh, entering markets where there are no traditional banks etc so the, all this they are doing in like a strategical manner and yeah further they have also like strategically focused on their income generation loan like we saw around 77 percent of the om is uh, agriculture and allied activities so <clears throat> they have restricted their cross sell and top up loans we saw like it was only around two percent and they mainly cater to the borrowers involved in agriculture and allied activities which is considered uh, as the most sustainable cash flow generating occupation in rural areas and as of june 2022 approximately like i said yeah 77 percent of their portfolio was agriculture and secondly their commitment towards their customer centric approach reflects in not like pushing uh, their cross sell products and also they also try to maintain a customer leverage by limiting top up loans to the same customers so that again we saw in the same pie chart lastly i'd just like to quickly mention that their csr activities they are very big on this they also do scholarship programs livelihood programs so you can see the amount of beneficiaries that they have which i found was pretty unique compared compared to any uh, any of its peers as such yeah with that i'd like to close thank you Wow, great presentation, Shantanu. High quality and precise. Absolutely, same feedback, man. Very, very high quality presentation. And your delivery is getting better in each mm -hmm. presentation. You were very crisp this time. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. So I, I already made up my mind to take a small token stake in this one. Very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially the promoter is interesting. I just want to know yeah. why is that? Uh, I mean, why did he take that pledge? I mean, that's that's something yeah, I want I to know. I was trying to find that, but I could not. That's why I put it in the for, further investigation. So part. I, I have a uh, you know comment here. So see, yeah. basically, the way I understand, uh, if there is a pledge, okay, that pledge is sort of uh, problematic because um against the pledge the person is taking some personal loan and suppose there is some stress on the loan there is a threat that he might have to sell the pledge stocks and and therefore the stock sort of uh comes down right because a large percentage will be sold in the open mm -hmm. market yeah. under stressful scenarios right uh in this case gaurav i think because the promoters jointly own i think 50 percent and this guy is a small is, is the smaller promoter and has pledged a 2.36 percent I am a little more comfortable because he's not the sort of the sole promoter. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm right or not. That is one thing that came to my mind. Ki iska pledge thoda shayad less risky hai compared to a single pro. Let's say mass financial mein agar pledge hota na, I would have been more concerned. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That guy owns like 70% of the company. Yeah. Right? So uh, yeah. Yeah. Usko wo 2% bej bhi dega na, usko farak bhi nahi padega. But if he gives it 2% of base, dega, 50 of his holding in the company is gone. Yeah. Such Dev only owns like 5%. Right? So, yeah. Got it. OK, my next uh, item was this GNPA, NNPA rise that we saw in 2021. I think that's because of the RBI regulation, right? Yeah. Most likely. No, that is because of COVID, I think. Well, you know, sorry, 2021, no? Yeah, yeah, 2020, that spike must be COVID. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it COVID? Because the majority okay. of yeah, the yeah. Yeah. 
RBI regulation came in FY23, Gaurav. I think it came like two or three quarters back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, that yeah, you mentioned because since they lend to rural area, so the repayment thing was a problem during. Uh, yeah. COVID. See the important thing here, now, Shantanu, what what yeah. I start tracking when there is a spike in GNPA ah. is how much is the collection efficiency after the recovery starts. Okay. So collection efficiency is a very very important graph, you know, for these kind of companies. What happens is. Uh, during stress, the collection efficiency goes to 50%, 60%, okay? Which means out of 100 EMIs due, only 50 were collected. Okay. We have to see how well the collection efficiency rebounds above 100 in the quarters following the crisis. You know, okay. so that, that means uh, that if it's greater than 100, it means they are they are starting to pay back. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And, and if that number remains below 100, that means they are just adding to their GNPA list hmm. or to their stage staged assets list, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that is, for example, in Mannapuram Finance owns a subsidiary called Ashirvad, which is into microfinance. Okay. So those guys, they had a quarter where they did 24% collection efficiency, which means they couldn't collect anything, right? This was during COVID phase one. And uh, now their collection efficiency is around 110% or something like that. So okay. this is a leading indicator of GNP. Because if collection is not good, it will stay in the stage. First stage 1, then yeah. stage 2, then yeah. stage 3. Stage three yeah. So yeah. So I, I think for future analysis, you I should keep that in mind. Yes. Yeah. We should also keep it in the uh, PPT then, Nirvana. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah. that I makes think sense. So. The thing is, a lot of companies don't declare it. But yeah, I think mm. it's important enough to mm. be kept. Uh, in. OK. I have Mayank, another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gaurav, I think Mayank had a question. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, Shant, we have a great presentation, a great delivery. I agree. Uh, I two questions to me. One, first, I mean, they are operating in such a niche, a rural area, women, noble cause. Yeah. Hai. But again, uh, is it addressable market? Is it for the future plans? Can they expand their product? Can they expand their product? Can they expand their centric? Hai. Centric on this only. That's why they are expanding more in the inaccessible areas. Uh, and they believe these all these small uh, entrepreneurs who are just starting their business, uh, that is their main target as such. And yeah, all women. All right. Uh, in the latest quarterly results, uh, check here. No? Uh, latest uh, as in. Uh, 35 slide. P ratio. Nee, key ratio sorry, 35 slide. So slide in general coffee fish ki nahi lag rahi hai. I mean uh, ROAs they haven't crossed two percent at all. This year they're trailing posting four point five percent. ROAs they have never crossed twelve percent. This year they're posting two point five percent. Uh NPAs ka to I'll understand chalo, hai. COVID tha, uska wo hua. But again, NPAs such a stable of fifty percent is other. I mean iske peche ke explanation agar, uh, I would have missed it, but it's a explanation. It's the steep rise. It's the Achanak book. It's the clean case. Achanak, you mean ROI ROI numbers? Correct. Achha, no. Uh, so, yeah, because uh, their profitability was uh, low in FY22. Even their PAT was 22 crores. So, that was the reason it was 1.7% and 0.3%. Whereas, nine months uh, uh, trailing FY23. They managed to get it to their uh, Abika level. So they want to maintain it. Usi mein 18%, 20%, and then 4.5 to 4.75%. That is what they said in their conk call. So okay. if I can or, just yeah. step in here, I think uh, two things must have happened, Shantanu and Mayank. One is that 2021 and 2022 huge spike in NPAs, which means a lot of credit costs in their PNL, right? So they may be making good profits at operational level, but a lot of the profits would be getting wiped off due to provision, right? Mm -hmm. In 21 and 22. In 23, a lot of provisioning would be reversed also because what probably they had provided for, they are able to collect. Plus, new provisioning is less because people are less stressed now. So that is one of the reasons why profit would be higher and therefore ROE, ROA, everything would be higher. And the second one would also be that uh, RBI relaxed the lending uh, interest rates, right? Okay. I don't exactly remember which year they did that, but maybe in the last one or two years only they've done that. So maybe that's earning, uh, letting them earn a higher NIM. 
Yeah, that's what they are mentioning about their LLPs that they have yeah. been decreasing. That is helping them increase the ROI, ROI numbers again. Okay, what is LLP, Shantanu? I didn't understand actually. Limited liability partnership. So, ये क्या है मतलब all the every loan is called an LLP क्या? नहीं नहीं wait one second I made a note. Because yeah, because I also didn't know what an your, your statement was ROE ROE was affected due to LLPs in 21 22 in the PPT. I made a note of that. Yeah. So, maybe we can, you know, I, I will anyway send across a, a feedback hmm. sheet. So Usme we can address maybe. Yes. Uh, so this is in regards to their provisioning actually. Achha, okay. Yeah, so on the days past due, basically, how they make uh, provisions at each stage, the correct. three stages. Correct, correct. So, so, ECL provisioning, expected yeah. credit uh, loss provisioning. But LLP, se aa hai usme? Matlab, what, is, what is an LLP got to do in their business model? That I didn't understand. Okay, one second. I just... made a note actually. No worry, Shantaru, I calm. Karte. I think we have already, we are at 50 minutes. So uh, we'll park this question for now. Okay. Uh, we'll discuss it offline. Okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, anyway, great presentation. I really enjoyed uh, listening to this. Learned a lot. Very interesting company. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Nirvan, in your sheet, just add this question. Why has the yeah. cost of borrowing decreased during COVID? I'm just curious yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I thought while listening to that slide is unka na cost of borrowing inordinately high tha, 13% tha, hmm. So maybe mujhe lagta hai ki as they started performing better, wo better ho gaya. Because one, one other change Gaurav, we have to make is for microfinance companies, ILFS is not the right crisis actually. So people who are, as Shantanu mentioned, so people who are presenting microfinance companies, they should talk about the quotas affected by COVID and demonetization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. that was a mistake that uh, Shantaru pointed out nicely. So us time pe na inko stress hua hi nahi hai. So ALM stress hua hoga, but cost of borrowing ek thak raha hoga. So, yeah, I noted this question. Okay, uh, I think uh, Kunal, if you're ready, we can start with Five Star, another excellent business. Wait, I'll stop re uh, recording and we'll record once more. Yeah, yeah, sure.